Father, we know that the hour is late. And soon our brief moment of time on this earth in human history will be gone. And yet our life and our time that you give us on this earth are not insignificant. And I pray that in these moments, as we will think together about your word that speaks pointedly and practically to our hearts with a challenge, that we would respond with, yes, Lord, yes, use my life for your glory in my life during this time on earth. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Someone said before church, I see we're covering two verses today. Are we going to be here all day? That man is very well experienced in hearing me preach, evidently. I don't think so, but I think verses 21 and 22 of 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 go together in such an organic way that to consider verse 21 requires that we look at verse 22. They go together. They, they complement each other. And as always, it is my hope and prayer that this preacher realizes that this is the word of God and not his word. And that the hearers hear this as God's word, not as the preacher's message, but rather as God speaking to his sheep. My title today on this uh, sermon, with this sermon and on this text, is Holy Discernment. I want to read. Verses 21 and 22, which is a continuation of a paragraph that began in verse 12. But, verse 21 begins, but examine everything carefully. Hold fast to that which is good. Abstain from every form of evil. Examine, analyze, investigate everything in your life and do so carefully, biblically, spiritually, eternally. And that which we are told in the scripture we are to embrace and hold fast because it is good. Every doctrine, every teaching, every challenge, every warning, every command, we are to hold firmly with faith and obedience because it is good. And we are to abstain from every form of evil, whatever evil there is, we should refrain from doing that which dishonors God, denies God, disrespects God, and disobeys God. Now, I'm framing my thoughts around the three verbs that we see here in these two verses. Examine, hold fast, and abstain. I'm reading the New American Standard Bible. That's the rendering of these three verbs. And perhaps your translation, if different, may have it a little bit different as well. But these are the three notable pillars in these two verses that together speak powerfully to me and to you as those who claim to believe in Christ who claim to be disciples of Christ. We are commanded to examine everything carefully, hold fast to that which is good, and abstain from every form of evil. Let's investigate 
each of those statements. First, examine everything very carefully. We are throughout the scripture uh, commanded by God and exhorted by God to examine things carefully. We're to live with intention and with purpose, not just uh, serendipitously uh, or randomly, whatever happens, happens, but we're to examine everything before God's Word. Lamentations 3.40 uh, commands us, let us examine our ways and turn back to the Lord. Here Jeremiah is calling to the people of God in the midst of judgment to make an examination of themselves and to come back to God. It is similar to Paul's statement in 2 Corinthians 13, 5, when he says, examine yourselves whether or not you be in the faith. The Bible tells us in Romans 12, verse 2, that this examination requires that we make some uh, calls of distinction. Do not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may be able to prove and test and approve what God's will is, that which is good, acceptable, and perfect. That takes an examination. It takes a testing to do that. The Berean church in Acts 17, verse 11, a uh, good example for us because the text there says of them, they received the word of God with great eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. That is, the things that Paul was preaching to them. They went back to the scriptures to see if what Paul said was in the scriptures. They gave an examination of every teaching. John reminds us in his first epistle, chapter 4 and verse 1, believe not every spirit, but test the spirits to see if they be of God. So, we are commanded here in this admonition to investigate, examine, prove, test every idea, every plan, every proposed effort, every motive, every value, every belief, and do so with the Word of God in our hands. Second, we're told to hold fast to that which is good. Hold fast. So the examination reveals, as we look into God's Word, to evaluate everything that we hear and are told to believe and to do. We read God's Word and we see what God's Word says about those things. And what do we do? We hold fast to what God says because that is good. Ephesians 5.10 says it like this. Try to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. You don't have to please your buddies. You don't have to please the culture. You don't have to please this one or that one. But we do have to try to please God. Hebrews 10, 23 <clears throat> reminds us, let us hold unswervingly. Hold unswervingly to the hope we profess for he who is promised is faithful. What a remarkable description of holding the truth fast and firmly. It, we hold it unswervingly. We don't move in this direction or that direction. Titus 1 verse 9 says, Holding fast the faithful word which is in accordance with the teaching. That is the teaching of the gospel. So that... He, that is the elder or the pastor, will be able to exhort in sound doctrine and refute those who contradict. One of the most fundamental needs of a pastor, of a church leader, is to hold fast the faithful word so that he can teach the doctrine of the faith and refute those who contradict it. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. We'll get to 2 Thessalonians in a few weeks. And verse 15 says, So then, brethren, stand firm and hold to the traditions that you were taught. This isn't the tradition of grandpa. This is not the tradition of your family. These are the traditions of the apostles, the teachings of the, of the apostles who taught the word of God to them. Paul admonished the Corinthians many times and, and also disciplined them 
But here in 1 Corinthians 16, 13, he, he calls them to stand firm in the faith and be alert. What does it mean to hold fast to that which is good? It means to believe what the Bible says is true. It means to believe what the Bible says is right. And what the Bible says is true is in contradistinction to what is false. What the Bible says is right is in contradistinction to what is wrong. The Bible makes that decision. Hold fast with what I'll call a holy stubbornness and a tenacity and resolve but also with holy love and separation from the world, intent to bring glory and honor to God through your obedience because you are a follower of Christ. Follow His teaching. Seek to apply the Scripture to every area of your life. Seek to bring glory and honor to the Lord and judge every choice you make, every belief you embrace, and every decision with which you're confronted with obedience to Christ and the application of Scripture. Hold fast to that which is good. Third, abstain. Abstain from every form of evil. If Christians are to examine everything carefully and hold fast to that which is good, this will be by necessity a requirement that we separate from the way pagans and the unsaved people live and that we will separate ourselves from every form of evil that the Bible says is wrong. Therefore the Bible teaches abstinence and the Christian faith teaches that we should abstain in self-control from all those things that dishonor God. First Thessalonians chapter 1 going back to the first chapter verses 7 and 9 he commends these believers and he says, You became examples to all the believers how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. Turning to God means to turn away from sin and from idolatry. Second Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 6 says, We command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep away from every brother who leads an unruly life, not according to the tradition which you receive from us. Here we are told we're actually to separate ourselves from those who were formerly in our group as believers, but now deny Christ. Paul warned the pastors in Acts 20 that from their own pastoral group, men would rise preaching against Christ. The Bible commands us in 2 Corinthians 6, come out from among them, be separate, says the Lord. Again, in this epistle, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 3, we saw earlier when we preached through this chapter. This is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from fornication or sexual immorality. Let me suggest this means a number of important things. It means that we abstain from all ideas that are not biblical. Political ideas, philosophical ideas, religious ideas. All ideas that are not scriptural, we are to abstain from those ideas. No matter how much they appeal to your mind, how much they make sense to you, no matter how much they appeal to your carnal flesh, ideas that are not found in Scripture are false ideas that we must reject. It means we should abstain all moral choices that are not biblical. I should say immoral choices that are not biblical. I don't care if the popular culture affirms these things. If modern people believe these things, then we are not to follow along with the trend and the current of the day. But we are to follow Christ by obeying Scripture. No matter how much these, these fleshly choices may appear to you to be pleasing and alluring, you're to refuse them. I don't care if people put pressure on you, around you. Get in with it. Get with us. Don't be the person left out. We are to follow Christ. And if that means we're the only ones standing, so be it. We're to abstain from all lifestyles that are morally repugnant to God. By the way, when you read the scripture, you realize God is very clear about this stuff. It's not to suggest that there aren't things we don't understand about the scripture. But God screams and shouts 
about the things he really means for us to get. And if God says something is wrong, what should we say? It's wrong. If it dishonors God, if it's an abomination to God, then that that is what we should say as well. We should commit ourselves as Christians to abstain from these evil things so that we do not lead others astray. We do not want to dishonor God. This is our life. I remember the, uh, this good man Barnabas in Acts chapter 11 and verse 23. When there were those in Antioch who got saved, the church in Jerusalem sent Barnabas to Antioch to check them out. And the scripture says here, he witnessed there the grace of God and he rejoiced and began to encourage them with all resolute heart to remain true to the Lord. To remain true to the Lord means you examine everything carefully, hold fast everything that is good, and abstain from every form of evil. Now, the application. Why do we need to do this? Why do we need to be discerning? We need discernment. We need to evaluate for three reasons. One, the devil is sneaky. The devil is sneaky. The devil is a trickster. The devil is deceptive. Jesus said about him in John chapter 8, the devil is a liar. Paul said about him, he comes as an angel of light. 2 Corinthians 11, Genesis chapter 3, he appeared to Eve and, and seemed to be what he really wasn't. Oh, I'm on your side, Eve. I want you to be uh, the, the, that bad husband of yours. Uh, we, this is the first feminist movement. We want you to be actualized. We want you to be empowered. You can be a goddess. What a liar the devil is. Matthew 4, such gall the devil has, he even tries to trick Jesus in his temptation. Let me say to you and to myself, you're no match for the devil. You're no match for the devil. You say, oh, I can figure things out. I'm a pretty bright person. You're no match for the devil, I warn you. He can outthink you. He can outtalk you. He can outargue and debate you. The devil is sneaky. Two, the world is alluring. Oh, the world is alluring. It seems so compelling. If given its presuppositions, the world seems to make sense. It entices the sinful flesh. It contradicts the word of God. The world denies its accountability before God and God's judgment. It declares that to be freedom when in fact it is really enslavement. A father and his son walked by the red light district in a great city. Where all sorts of sins were committed. And as they walked by the boy said, Dad what is that over there? Pointing to the part of the city where there was much sin and his Wise father said, son, that's hell. And the boy said, but the smells are sweet. And I hear music and the lights are so alluring. And the father said, son, if you go in there, it'll cost you nothing to go. But it'll cost you everything to get out. David Wells, in his book entitled Losing Our Virtue... Subtitled, Why the Church Must Recover Its Moral Vision. Says the following about worldliness. Worldliness is that system of values in any given age which has as its center our fallen human perspective. Which disgraces God and His truth from the world. And makes sin look normal. And righteousness, righteousness look strange. It makes what is morally wrong seem plausible. And what is wrong it makes to seem normal. End of quote. It reminds me of C.S. Lewis's uh, often uh, seen and quoted uh, uh, quote. When the world is running towards the edge of the cliff, he who runs in the opposite direction appears to his law have lost its mind. His mind. So the world is alluring. The devil is sneaky. 
Third, our flesh is weak. We are weak. I am weak. You are weak. We're vulnerable. We're temptable. We fail and we can fail miserably. Jesus declared this when the disciples failed to pray with him even for an hour in the greatest challenge of Jesus' life. Our flesh is frail. The world is alluring and the devil is sneaky. We need to learn to evaluate and discern. Well, by what standard, we ask? What is the standard of evaluation? May I just be so clear to say, the Word of God is our standard. The measure of all things is the clear teaching of the Scripture. Not Scripture plus what someone else says, what the pastor says, what the church says, what the convention says, but the Scripture alone. The, not the scripture plus the professor at the ungodly college. But the scripture alone. The clear didactic teaching passages of the scripture. The clear warnings of the scripture. The clear case studies in the narratives of the scripture. What Jesus said. How he lived. What he taught. The New Testament. And all of its teachings. This is our standard I'm reminded of what the Bible says in Psalm 119. How can a young man keep his way pure? By keeping it according to your word. Your word. I have treasured in my heart that I might not sin against you. Again, the psalmist says, Your word, O Lord, is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. It is the word of God and the word of God alone that can and will deliver us from false thinking and false living. That is why we must learn the Word of God. We must learn to interpret the Word of God. Our souls depend upon it. And what is our motivation? Well, we want to honor the Lord. We want to show the Lord we love Him. We want to please Him. And we fear Him. If we do not live for the Lord, surely as He Discipline Jonah, he will discipline us. He will come to his people because he loves us. And he will take away that idolatry from our hearts. And bring us back into a loving affection for him. Be sure of this. If anything comes between us and our Lord. He will take it away even if it's painful in doing so. I don't know how long to spend on this. My time is hastening on but I do want to indicate there is a difference between discernment and legalistic judgmentalism those who are legalist and judge all the time think they know it all they think they've got it all right and they become the conduit from God to other people they feel like they can judge they can condemn they can approve and they can punish and if you don't agree with them they will protest outside your house these are judgmentalists. This is not discernment. Discernment means that we're able to separate between that which is truly knowable and that which is unknowable. We're able to separate the core from the secondary issues. And then we humbly reflect on the Bible and its teaching and commit ourselves to what God says. What are the examples of people who fail to do this even in the church? There are those I'll call the go-along to get-along Christian. Oh, just go along with how things are going. Those who are the, I think God is just love, Christian. Everything's about love, never about righteousness. Then there are those who are progressive. Let's be up to date. Let's be cool, Christians. And then there's those that say, surely the Bible doesn't mean that, Christians. Then there are those that say, the Bible's okay for Sunday, but for other things, I look at websites. There are those who say, God wants me happy, so this choice makes me happy. I know the Bible says don't do it, but I want to be happy. God wants me happy, so he says it's okay type of Christian. I must be clear to say, many of these people who think and talk like that are not Christian at all. What are the tragic results of failing to discern? First, in a personal life. Second, in a church. And we conclude. The tragic results in an individual's life who fails to take the Bible as his compass 
as his roadmap for life is a person who soon will be drawn away from the truth and when they are drawn away from the truth they will be drawn away to other ideas and thus through those ideas to sin it is a degenerating process sin is never done with us if we give in to it if we yield to it if we say yes to it it will draw us further down into the the hole of darkness until finally we cannot see the light at all. Then we become critical of the Bible. Then we become critical of Christians who follow the Scriptures. We use ourselves as the measure of judgment for anyone who doesn't agree with us. And we become the instrument of the devil. What about a church that fails to discern? Lovingly, scripturally, intentionally discern. It means that churches then begin to substitute human thinking, human standards for biblical teaching. It's human guidelines that we go to instead of the word of God. That church soon will lose the ability to rightly judge anything. And it will enter into idolatry and darkness. You can actually do religious stuff and all that time be serving the devil in idolatry. They will lose their perception of purity. They will lose their taste for truth. They may have a lot of people coming, but they are not a church of Jesus Christ. And I'll be candid. I fear that in our church as well. Well, how do I wrap that up? By saying a number of things. I would urge us all to make this commitment. We commit ourselves and our church to the whole counsel of God's word in doctrine and in moral teaching. For us, there's only one question. What does God's word, the Bible, say? And we commit ourselves to it. David Wells, in his book that I quoted from earlier, writing some years ago now, he said, we are watching in the present time the disintegrating moral culture in American society. Let me pause and say, I think he was right, but I think it's, it's now a done deal. I don't think the American society has any shred of any evidence left of that which honors God in it. We are given over to ideas that are enslaving us. He continues... The evangelical church today has little appetite for a work that brings the truth of God's word into lively intersection with the life of the church as it exists in our own culture with the intention of seeking Christian understanding, character, and behavior. And then he adds this, in the generation to come, evangelicals will learn how costly that kind of mistake is has been end of quote I think we're there we are now facing difficult decisions the questions now have changed it's not how do we get more people to come to church but it's how do we live in obedience to God in a depraved generation the question has changed John Piper writing about John Newton said of, of him that he had a tender heart and a backbone of steel. I urge us all to have a tender heart and a backbone of steel. And hear the words of Deuteronomy 32, verses 46 and 47. Take to your heart all the words with which I am warning you today and command them to your sons to observe carefully all the words of the law. For it is not an idle word for you. Indeed, it is your life. Let us pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, we thank you today. For so much of our history, 
with which we have been blessed. It's not to suggest, Father, you know it more than anybody, how sinful people can be and have been in every era of time. You know our sins and our weaknesses. But Lord, we would pray and beg of you that in this day where so many who claim the name of Christ are walking away from the Bible, walking away from the biblical teaching regarding doctrine, morality, human relationships, and even uh, societal covenants and agreements of how we are to live together. I would ask you, O God, that you would raise up a mighty, righteous generation in this day and in the day to come. I pray that you would bear fruit from this church, fruit that remains. I especially pray for our young people, that they would join us as they grow older to stand for Christ in their time, and that they would take hold Of the plow. As Jesus said. And not look back. But to follow after Christ. Doing the hard work of the kingdom. Sowing the seed. Cultivating the land. And praying for a harvest. Unto righteousness. O God of heaven. Have mercy upon us. And raise up a mighty generation. In this nation. And indeed the world. Defeat the devil in every wretched, wicked thing he's doing. And raise up a godly people for your namesake, we pray. In Jesus' name. 